So hi, welcome everyone, great to see you. Uh, I'm here to talk about my Sonic Lifeforms project, which is actually uh, my last music album, and I like to call it the never-ending album because the music on this album keeps reinventing itself. Every time you're coming back to the album and you're listening to a track on the album, it's, not, it's never gonna be the same music twice. So it's always coming up with new variations, and um, that's why I like to call it the uh, the Never Ending Music Album, and it's also got some nice visuals. I know it's tiny, just to show you. Some nice visuals, and they are responsive to the audio as well. And it has a, um, a nice uh, user interface with um, a 2D XY pad, and that's where you can deal, uh, dial in the, the way you want to listen to your music. So like, if you want to have a minimalistic version, you just put the cursor up there. If you want to go towards a more full arrangement style, go with the cursor over here. Or you want it more ambient, atmospheric, or more rhythmical, or anything in between, you just choose how you want to listen to the music of the album. So it's an interactive album too. too. And uh, it's an iOS app, so I released it on the App Store. You can download it for, download it for iPhones and uh, iPads, of course. And um, it was built entirely in the Unreal Engine using uh, blueprints and metasounds. And um, based on that project, I really like to talk about all the cool things that you can do with procedural music in general in the Unreal Engine. Uh, with meta sounds and with blueprints, because I really think that when it's done right, this can add tremendous value to like any kind of project. And um, of course, we're also going to talk a little bit about you know making this all happen in the engine, blueprints, meta sounds, and stuff. Um, so we've got a lot to cover today, um, but let me take a quick moment to introduce myself. My name is Michael Dörfler. But everybody calls me Mitch in the music industry, and I'm from Vienna, Austria. That's pretty far away from here, all the way back in Europe. And um, I'm in the music industry for solid 30 years or something, I guess, uh, mostly doing traditional music production, which means being in the recording studio, uh, producing albums with local artists, with international artists, uh, even had the luck of grabbing some Golden Platinum Awards along the way and uh, also had the pleasure with, uh, of working for some American artists you might know, mostly remix stuff and uh, some production work, like uh, DMX, the rapper, you might know him, Cisco, even did um, a Vanilla Ice remix a long time ago together with a friend. Ice Ice Baby, the dubstep version, that was fun. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, that's uh, what, my, what my main line of work is, but also sometimes film music, uh, always loving that, and I got my hands dirty as a musical uh, sound designer for theater plays, and uh, sometimes I'm taking the role of a musical director uh, for TV casting shows back in Europe. So yeah, that's what I'm doing mainly, but of course, what really gets me going is, uh, of course, my own creative stuff. So uh, whenever I find the time, I try to moonlight as an artist, and uh, I really got this thing for you know trying to push the envelope when it comes to audio tech and production techniques and that uh, is what eventually brought me to next gen audio and procedural music systems in uh, generative music systems and of course interactive music systems and uh, several years ago that made me enter that rabbit hole that is called the unreal engine i guess everybody did at some point here um, and yes i guess that's why i'm here today and I think I know what you might be thinking now. You might think, okay, this guy, this is not a game developer. And you're right, I'm not. Or you might think, uh, is he at least working full time in the, in the industry as a game audio specialist? Sometimes, some projects, but not really my gig either. So why is he talking to us then today? Well, and that's a good question, why an audio guy? When I'm checking out the Unreal Engine website and I see this long list of application areas, uh, and I'll find, you know, of course, game dev and simulation and visualization, virtual production, automotive, whatever, and think, I really think there's one item missing on that list, and that item is music and audiovisual applications. Because I think the Unreal Engine, over the last few years, has secretly and quietly developed into a very, very powerful tool for that. 
And so I think it's, uh, maybe it's interesting to hear things from a point of view of, an, of a music producer. And uh, you might also think, why is, it, why is this such a big deal for this guy? Because, you know, audio producers, you already got this awesome software. And yes, you're right, we have all these DAWs. They're all cool, we love them, we use them. Uh, but they all are designed to produce static output. Like, you may come up with a production, and at the end of the day, you're rendering out an audio file, a static audio file. And yes, there's also standalone software that lets you create generative music systems even with interactivity, but there's also a catch. They're all like, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to share that with the listeners, you kind of have to lug the entire system to the audience. And, I mean, that's cool for a sound installation somewhere or for an exhibition somewhere, uh, but not for everyday use. And that's where the Unreal Engine comes in, because in the Unreal Engine, you can create procedural music systems, very, very good procedural music systems, but then you go and add all the other cool features of the, uh, of the engine. User interface, script logic, 2D graphics, 3D graphics, and so on and so on. And then you go and turn that into a smartphone app, or into a tablet app, or a desktop app, or even for consoles and smart TVs. And for me, as a music producer, this is an absolute game changer. It's the first time that I can deliver a living music system that is also interactive, responds to user interaction, and deliver that directly to the listeners, to download for them on their phones and carry it in, in their pockets and listen to it wherever they want. Never had a tool like this before. So this is a big deal for us audiovisual artists. And if it's a big deal for us, audio folks, and uh, we're really thrilled about this, then there might be something in it for everybody else too, because if you think of all the cool effects that uh, music can have on any kind of project, like you know immersion and setting up the mood, uh, stir up emotion, user captivation, you name it. If you're not doing that with static pre-produced music, but if you're doing that with a living music system that can react to user input and evolve from there on, I mean, you can multiply all these effects if you're doing it that, that way. So I think it's cool for everybody else too. And um, yeah, uh, when I started diving into that whole topic, uh, I was never planning on doing a never-ending album, a music album with it. I just wanted to know what's possible. I just wanted to come up with a very, very flexible, reusable system, generative music system for the Unreal Engine that is highly adaptable to any use case, to any, and that was very important for me, to any musical genre. Just switch out some assets, tweak some parameters, and there you go, you have a complete different music style. That's what I wanted to do. And all of a sudden I was like, okay, I can do this. And suddenly this old idea of mine popped up in my head, this never-ending album. I said, okay, now it's finally the time to do it. So I kind of pulled the handbrake on everything, got all in, and that's what Son when Sonic Life Forms came to life. And okay, before talking too long, I have prepared a little demo video to show you how Sonic Life Forms look like and how they sound like, and then we're gonna talk about uh, this for a bit. Here it goes.
So yeah, that's Sonic Live Forms. And uh, all the music you heard, this was just an audio capture from the app, just recorded the output for a few minutes and edited the video to it. And um, okay, before we talk uh, about how to set this all up in the Unreal Engine, let's uh, quickly talk about some fundamental strategies when it comes to procedural music systems. And uh, I think it's very important to um, understand the basic principles of procedural music because believe me, the implementation part uh, in the Unreal Engine, that's really the easy bit. We've got nodes and functions for everything, but in order to get such, such a system running, we have to think about basic concepts and we have to identify the necessary variables that we need to control the system and to fine tune the system. Yeah? And so uh, procedural music or generative music uh, fundamentally relies on something that I like to call controlled randomness. So it's random, but within set boundaries and within a set of rules uh, to keep it predictable and controlled and also to avoid chaos. So it will always be about keeping a balance between stability and orientation, but also introducing the element of surprise here. And um, we can approach this at two different levels. One is uh, using controlled randomness at a core level to generate single nodes that will form melodies and patterns. Uh, and the other one is uh, using many layers of pre-produced musical building blocks and letting the system handle the arrangement and the assembly and the processing and the mixing of all those musical building blocks. And uh, I've tried both and both strategies can uh, produce wonderful results and have both the benefits and merits, but uh, the first one, in my opinion, really lacks uh, flexibility when it comes to you know, setting up a reusable system that is highly adaptable uh, to any kind of musical genre. So you will find yourself coming up with a new idea for a new system for every new project. So we have to say goodbye to that for today because um, Sonic Life Forms is relying on the second strategy, mu musical building blocks. And, um, with this uh, system here, as I said, uh, we're using these pre-produced musical building blocks and we're going to combine them in ever-changing variations. So there will be a lot of constellations happening. And if you see, I don't know if you can see it, the wave player notes here in Metasounds, they are just perfect for that. Playing sync, uh, many layers of audio in perfect sync, I mean sample accurate sync, that's what they're good at. And we're going to use them for that. And there's one other thing that's important here is uh, when I'm organizing these layers of, uh, of musical building blocks, uh, I'm not thinking in terms of specific instruments here. I'm thinking in terms of musical purpose. That will be very important. So for instance, uh, I'm not labeling these tracks like drums and piano and violin. I'm saying, okay, we have basic rhythmic elements, whatever that might be. Or we have high frequency percussive elements or a depth layer, something that adds dimension to our arrangement. That's the way I'm thinking about here, not specific inst instruments. And uh, this will also maybe remind you of this, you know, vertical layering approach that is often used in game music. Uh, but it's really not because we don't have like a bass layer with the main track of the music and then we're adding some more layers to add excitement and suspense. No, these are uh, uh, all layers that can live on their own and in any combination. Uh, so they are all equally important, these layers. There's no bass layer here. And um, there are some real advantages for me uh, when I'm using this uh, system. And uh, one and the probably most important uh, advantage here is that I'm able to use my studio workflows, my familiar studio workflows. So I can tweak my studio gear, I can record instruments, I can invite the, invite the musician uh, to be recorded, or I can even use my 30 year old space echo tape delay if I want that vintage dub reggae vibe for an element. And uh, by you know, baking in all these sound design aspects and all these production techniques and then uh, 
chopping everything up and letting the system reassemble everything, I really think I get the best of both worlds here. And uh, this also makes it a system that is highly reusable for any musical style. So you see, uh, I've got this, uh, uh, audio assets here, just have to exchange them, have to uh, come up with some new audio asset, uh, uh, assets that I'm feeding to uh, my system, tweak a few parameters and I'm ready to go for a new music musical style. And uh, another thing that is very important that we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes is uh, interactivity. And this system makes interactivity really easy as we will see. Uh, and then there's one more thing. Uh, which is very important to me, and uh, which is very important to me generally when I'm talking about music, is being able to control the level of complexity. This is uh, not only important for procedural music, uh, but especially when it comes to generative music systems. And it's a very interesting topic, and believe me, I could do, do a complete separate talk on that uh, topic. Uh, like, you know, just have to think of uh, pattern recognition in the human brain and how the human brain deals with pattern rec recognition. So, like, you have a pattern that is very simple and uh, is easily memorized by our brain and will be immediately processed in the back of our brain. And then you're introducing another uh, pattern that is more complex and the brain will immediately focus on that and the other one is still running in the background. Then all of a sudden you're changing just a little bit of the background pattern and our brain is going like, oh, I have to check out what's going on there. And then you're introducing a third pattern with, you know, that's overly complex and the brain immediately gives up and says, okay, that's just organic noise. I can't uh, recognize what that is. So you can really play with the brain. And so I gotta stop right now because time is limited, but it's really a very important topic here. And um, I, I even gave it, gave it its own title slide here. But um, we have to, what, the, the reason why we have to talk about it is we have to come up with strategies for introducing complexity to our systems and um, controlling this complexity. And one easy but very, very effective way is to use volume envelopes, which just basically means that we're gonna fade the layers in and out at certain points, uh, and of course individually. And an easy way to, uh, to picture this is, think of, a, think of a theater stage with the numbers of actors on the theater stage. And initially it's all dark, and then you're using random spotlights to illuminate some of them. And, uh, with these different spotlight combinations, they're going to interact in, in very many different ways, depending on standing, uh, are they standing close to each other, far apart. Uh, so every new spotlight combination brings a new uh, interaction to the story. And we can do exactly the same with these volume envel envelopes here. And alone, this, uh, this, uh, this strategy here would maybe for some applications be, suffi be sufficiently uh, complex to uh, create an interesting uh, result. But let's add another layer of complexity to that. And when I'm saying adding, I mean multiply, because every layer of complexity uh, that we're adding is actually multiplying that. And uh, let's stick to our example with the, with, the, with the actors on the stage. And now they are not only in varying spotlight situations, but they start shifting their positions on stage. So uh, this vastly increases the number of possible combinations and how they are interacting. So like the, the actor that was standing at the very back of the stage is suddenly standing close to that other actor and they are interacting completely differently. And combined with the whole spotlight thing, this really gives us a system that is already highly complex. And we can do exactly the same with our audio uh, content here, because who says that we all, uh, that we have to use exactly the same loop points for all audio layers, which is going to uh, introduce uh, varying uh, loop lengths. I would suggest using whole bar loop, loop lengths, because otherwise it's going to get weird. Uh, but other than that, just go ahead and the, uh, the musical content is going to start to, to shift against its, each other. You have to take that into account when you're composing that this can happen, but I can tell that's the, that's the fun part and it's easy, it can easily be done. So that's uh, strategy number two, two. But let's crank it up a notch and um, introduce another idea. So again, our theater stage with the actors, uh, varying spotlight conditions, shifting their position on stage, and now they're getting really crazy and they start changing their costumes. 
So like uh, the bad guy, in one moment he's acting and looking and talking like a, a James Bond villain, and a few seconds later he's transformed into an evil wizard. And uh, this gives us a completely different uh, variation. I mean, he's still the bad guy, still the same purpose in the play, but a completely new variation. And that's why I'm insisting on not labeling these uh, as specific instruments, but rather as um, uh, musical purposes. And I uh, simplified the graphics. So for instance, in my Sonic Lifeform system, I've got 16 layers of, uh, of audio content there. And it's const constantly um, changing what's on these layers. Like uh, the example with the high frequency percussive elements, it could be, you can throw anything on there. It could, it could be like a, a shaker loop at one point. A little bit later, it would be some tambourine pattern. And uh, a little bit later, it could be something that you recorded with metal spoons on your fridge little pattern, and then uh, you're using that for the exact same layer. And don't forget silence. Silence is also a very important part of music, very, very important part of mu music. So I think at this point, we have to deal with uh, that it's not getting too complex, but I've got one more, um, which is introducing real-time effects processing. And I'm thinking uh, modulated filtering, I mean, I guess many audio people here. Uh, so high cut filter that cuts off all the high frequencies. And of course, this can be modulated. So the filter frequency doesn't stay static, uh, but it's been modulated by an LFO, low frequency oscillator module, uh, which will introduce modulation patterns. And this is, of course, synced to the song tempo. And it's, of course, different on every musical layer. And this will introduce additional complexity and then add some delay effects, some reverb effects to, uh, to, to all of that, and you're really having a system that you can get creative with. Um, so uh, that's um, how you introduce complexity, and we're going to find variables and parameters how we can control this. Uh, but it's not only about coming up with a nice sounding generative music system. As we said, we want, also want it to be interactive. You want it to respond to input. And so we have to think of strategies for that as well. And um, the good thing is interactivity in the Unreal Engine is easy because it's designed to be running in real time and uh, processing uh, variables and parameters in, in real time. So we just have to come up with adjustable parameters. That's all we have to do, and we have to do that anyway if we want to tweak our system, if we want to have being able to do a good setup. So the moment we have parameters, uh, of course we're going to use them while we're working in the editor, while we're setting up our systems. But uh, when we have these variables, we can also tweak them uh, during gameplay by gameplay parameters like you know time of day or uh, how much action is going on or whatever you like, or by direct user input, of course. And uh, one thing is also important here, uh, when I'm talking about cha the change of parameters, I'm not talking about directly affecting the music, like switching on or off a layer or controlling a filter. With these variables that we are going to, uh, to, to use, uh, we are just setting new conditions for the randomizers. That's much more elegant. You're just telling the randomizer to behave in a different way, and so the music will evolve different, differently from there on. And the transitions are much smoother and everything. So, um, yeah, let's get a little bit specific now. Um, let's think of uh, a set of parameters that will directly affect our volume envelopes, you know, the spotlights. I think this is probably the most effective way of really changing the character of your musical output of the whole system. And um, these volume envelopes, they rely on trigger events that will initiate the fade-ins and the fade-outs for each layer. And so we're going to need some Boolean randomizers, uh, and they will determine when to shine the light on that audio layer and when to fade it away again. And we're doing this by continuously re-rolling the dice in a, in, in a specific time frame, like every two bars or every four bars, every 96 bars, we will roll the dice. Uh, and then we have our first uh, variable that we're going to use, the duration of the randomizer retriggering. And the next one will be, of course, we need a chance parameter for that, awaiting for the Boolean randomizer uh, that says how likely it is that 
you know, the fade in process will start. So we have variable number, number two. And of course, then we can add the times for the fade, fade in lengths, fade out lengths. And the good thing about it, as you see in the screenshot, uh, in MetaSounds, we have an envelope mode that just you can feed the trigger events, feed fade in length, fade out length, and, 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 and there, there you go. And this sounds very simple, but uh, this is highly effective if you think of it. I'll give you just a quick example. If you've got this musical element on one layer where you want it to be like popping up every now and then, just some add-on flavor that should, uh, should be in the music from time to time. Uh, how would you set up your variables here? You would say, okay, let's choose a very, very short re-trigger time for the, for, the, for the dice, like every two bars, and also set the chance very, very low. So what's going to happen? The dice are continuously being rolled, and almost every time it's going to be, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry. And all of a sudden, there's a go, fade in. Okay, your time to shine. And then this pattern is being faded in, is, uh, is, is audible. But for how long? Like two bars later, the dice are being rolled again, and most likely it's going to be, ah, oh, sorry, your two bars of fame are over, you're going to be faded out. No. But you can also, uh, say how much, uh, how long the fade uh, out will be. So you could uh, be merciful and give it another 35 seconds of fade out time. Huh? And so you see how, how you can completely change the characteristics of one simple layer just by these uh, three parameters. And I can tell you, this is really a joyful and playful process. If you come up with your musical building blocks and throw them into your system and tweak some parameters, the first time you hit play, you actually hear the first time what the system is coming up with and say, oh, okay, it's cool, but this one is too busy. Just tweak it here. And this one is a little bit, uh, I want to hear that more often. Tweak that one too. I oh, really, this is the best moment of pressing play and see what the, what the, what the system is coming, um, coming up. So um, these are three very important uh, variables that we're going to use, but also everything that's related to our effects processing uh, can be tweaked in real time and gives us interactivity uh, as well, like, like all the effects sense and the filters and the modulation for the filters, of course, the levels of the layers, and I always like to use a master filter uh, as well. Um, so I included some screenshots here to show you uh, how my setup in, for sonic live forms in the engine really is look, look, looking like. These are all my public variables. The audio assets that I'm using, then uh, what do we have? Levels for the layers, initial levels for the layers, delay sends for the layers, then of course all the randomizer stuff, randomizer lengths, how often, uh, how long does it take to be uh, uh, re-rolled the dice again, and then uh, the layer chances, and fade in times, fade out times, uh, LFA controlled filters, turning them on, off, and some, and many, many more. Just, just, to, just to show you how that works. And um, well, I'm going to go over there because I want to give you a quick demo how this sounds and how this looks like. And uh, for this, this is not actually a demo of of, of my my music album. I just want to show you that you can use uh, this system in any kind of application. And so I set up a quick demo level. I like to call it the Museum of Sonic Lifeforms, which is just a few uh, uh, differently themed rooms with a generative music system in every one of them. And uh, we should hop in, and then we will hear the music evolve. And um, then we can go from room to room and listen to different music. And when we come back to the same room that we have been before, you will hear that the music uh, will still uh, be evolving. And then, of course, there will be interactivity. So we've got some trigger volumes where you can step in, and that will trigger complete, complete new settings for the randomizers, completely changing how the music turns out, and even some continuous sliders where we can dial in some values. OK, um, let's. So we're here in one of the rooms. And we could stay here for like 50 minutes and just listen to the music, but we don't have the time. Uh, so I'm just stepping into another room. Where's, uh, this is the, the room with the underwater theme. And if we go back to the other room we were here, it's the same music track, we will recognize it, 
with a different variation. Oh, now let's focus on this choir and this arpeggio here. And we say, okay, let's check out how it sounds if we trigger that scene that is called atmospheric. And you see, it's not immediately changing, it's just evolving to a different style. Call that, that room here is also different style of music. This dystopian room here. And so we're starting with arrangement with distant drums and everything. And then I said, okay, there's one, one, one scene in the game where we just want the spooky elements. So we're setting new conditions for the randomizer and just wait. A very minimalistic version, but just the, min the spooky elements. Or, so, okay, next situation, let's go to that scene that's called drums only. It will evolve to drums only. But there's some other thing that I wanted to show you and I kind of have to rush through it because uh, we're time limited here. Uh, but here, another version, like this futuristic Gardens of Babylon thing here. And here I've got a continuous slider as well. Um, and I can move it completely to the right and the arrangement will evolve to a very rhythmic version. Slowly but surely. Or I can say now I want it more atmospheric here. And it will go to, into that direction or anything in between. Let's introduce a little bit of the rhythmical ele elements by putting the slider here going to morph all the settings. Sometimes we have to wait a bit, but rhythmic elements, ah, here they come. And we're getting the groove back again. So that's the beauty of it, is that we are, uh, we, we don't know exactly what will happen, but it's, we can control it, but we can't tell it exactly what music we want to hear. Just give it some conditions for the randomizers. So, yeah, a quick demo of how this can turn out here. And um, go back over there because I like talking over there. <laughs> so, um, let's see how we can set this all up in the, uh, in the Unreal Engine. And, uh, but, let me just quickly mention two, for me, game-changing additions to the uh, Unreal Engine that made making music in the Unreal Engine possible in the first place. And this is, of course, oh, does it work? Yeah. This is, of course, um, Boris Clock and uh, Metasounds, of course, uh, because uh, Quartz Clock, Clock gives us a really precise audio timing, and the other one, a wonderful playground and tool set for us audio engineers and uh, sound designers. And let's not forget about the tight integration with the rest of the engine. And if you combine that, you really got a powerful tool for making music here. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of timing, um, have you ever tried setting up a simple metronome just with blueprints, without Quartz Clock, without meta sounds? It's going to sound like that. Even starting to shuffle there. So, uh, and this is something that is 
absolute no-go when it comes to music. I mean, we're in, in New Orleans, in the town of music here, and everybody who's been in the band knows precise timing is, is, is absolutely crucial. I mean, if you're playing a melody instrument, hitting a wrong note, making the right face, acting all like it was intentional, you might get away with it. Huh? But if, you, <laughs> if you're losing the groove, if you're not keeping the time, tomatoes will be thrown. And if you, <laughs> if, if you, if you like it, like in the, in the rhythm section of a group uh, and you're skipping a beat, there might be even injuries in the audience. So uh, absolutely no go to not have precise audio timing. And the quartz clock is giving us exactly that. I, mean, I guess you all know about the quartz clock. It's sample accurate. It's completely independent from the game thread timing. And no matter how much stress you put on the game thread, uh, it will have stable timing. Um, like now this is what I call a stable metronome. And while I was recording that, I was really, I mean, was really putting stress on the game thread, like spawning stuff on tick like crazy, yeah? and the timing remained completely stable. Yeah? So uh, that's very, very, very important. And the other thing is, of course, uh, meta sounds. Don't have to introduce meta sounds to you. You all know it. Uh, just let me put it like this: If there was, this was a standalone software, I would be pretty happy with it. But now it's built inside of the Unreal Engine and it can communicate with uh, Blueprints. And since 5.3, it can even report back to uh, to the Blueprints what's happening inside of MetaSound. So just wanted to quickly mention these were two game changer additions that made the Unreal Engine interesting for me as a music producer. Okay, so um, let's have a quick look how my Sonic Lifeform system is uh, set up in the Unreal Engine. As I said, the impl implementation part, that's the easy bit. Uh, so it's basically two components, a Blueprint actor and uh, a MetaSound source. And of course, the Blueprint actor is responsible for uh, all the logic, and the MetaSound uh, will do all the DSP processing and all the, all the audio stuff. So um, what's happening in the Blueprint? Of course, everything quartz clock related. Setting it up, creating it, storing the handle to it, setting up BPM, time signature, stuff like that. The next thing that's happening here is, of course, spawning of the audio component, which is uh, an instance of the MetaSound source. And um, then next thing is uh, initializing all the parameters in the MetaSound. So I'm sending all the basic variables and basic uh, information over to the MetaSound, like which wave assets to use, uh, all the initial levels, effect sense, filter settings, stuff like that. And once that is all set up and everything is queued up, I'm starting the whole thing with you know the play quantized uh, node, which is uh, available in the quad subsystem, which is very important because you can tell the meta sound to start exactly at a bar, at the start of a bar, sample accurately. And this will be very important because for my Sonic Lifeforms album, I'm using two of those systems in sync. So two of those will be playing in parallel, and they have to start exactly at the same position, at the same bar. So uh, use the play quantized note, um, gives you many benefits. And uh, then the core of the whole thing is, of course, the randomizer logic that ha that's happening in the, uh, in the blueprints. And some, it's really not that difficult. Uh, there are some Boolean randomizer with weightings and stuff. Um, and that's uh, what's happening, of course, in the blues blueprint, because the logic side of things, that's the strong part uh, of the blueprints. And then there's something that I like to call like the secret sauce uh, that we're using here. And this is a little logic that will avoid uh, unwanted results. Uh, I mean, a simple example would be to avoid complete silence. So if that happens, if all the randomizers decide to fade everything out, you're going to overrule that and say, OK, no, let's re-roll the dice. But you can come up with any kind of idea that will shape your system to your musical taste. Like, you, I know, using a tagging system where you're building joke groups, there you say, OK, one, uh, if, if one layer is playing, the other one is not allowed uh, to be played, stuff like that. So you can come up with a, a logic like, like that. And um, this also tweaks how the whole thing, the, the, the whole thing sounds. And uh, in the meta sound, that is really easy because we've got nodes for everything. So first of all, we got this, uh, the, the wave players going on. In my system, I'm using eight layers of music per system. And if I want more, I'm just stacking the systems. Uh, so I have eight uh, wave players playing in sync. 
And um, at first, they're, of course, not audible because we're using these volume envelopes. Everything is dark at the, uh, at the beginning. And the randomizer is going to send the trigger events to our envelopes. And the envelopes are nodes in MetaSounds that you can just use. You know, just send the trigger, fade in, fade out length, and there you go. So this is happening uh, also in the MetaSound. Then, of course, all the effects processing. So we've got this filter uh, tools there, and even an LFO pre-built, ready, uh, ready for use. You just really have to tell it uh, 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 about the modulation cycles and patterns, and uh, you're using it. This is all per layer. And um, then, of course, the delay unit is built right inside of MetaSounds. Uh, you can ju just use it, feed it signal to. Um, then, of course, uh, uh, mixing. Everything has to be mixed together with uh, these mixer tools in, in there. All the signals from the wave players and from delay and stuff. And um, what I like to use is a, a master filter. Uh, because that can be sometimes quite handy if you uh, want to control it uh, from, from gameplay events. Like this underwater scene, you could just, uh, like the deeper you dive, the more muffled the sound gets. That's what a master filter is, is, is for. I've got a, a video on YouTube, so check out my, my, my YouTube channel uh, where I'm showcasing a scenario like that with the underwater scene. And I'm also always adding a little mastering section in my meta sound, which is basically just a brick wall limiter to avoid overshoots because the music is kind of unpredictable with hap what's happening, so you have to have that. And also a dynamic EQ that will control the, the, the energies of the low frequency range. But that's about it. That's my meta sound system here, or my Masonic Lifeform system. And uh, as I said, for my album, I'm using two of those systems for each track in sync, in parallel. And uh, you remember when I, when I showed you, I've got this XY interface here, where I can uh, choose how my music uh, should sound like. And one is the X axis, this will uh, be, um, this will have the signals from one system, and I have another system running for the Y axis. And it's pretty similar to what I did with this uh, AB slider in my demo before. And uh, for the X system, I'm just using the core elements of my track, so like drums and bass and basic chords and stuff. And the, the slider on the X uh, axis will just uh, control the intensity amount. So it will, be, it will control the chance settings of the randomizers in a way that on the left side, it will be very, very minimalistic core elements, but very few of them. And the further you go to the right, the more intense the arrangement be, uh, becomes, the higher the chance settings are being set up. And the same goes for the y-axis, but just with more ambient and atmospheric elements and add-on melodies, add-on effects. And so by combining those two, I get a really complex system uh, going up. And by, in, in order to do that, I have to introduce one more level in the hierarchy. Um, so that would be something like that, that I'm, well, where is it? Here, um, uh, I like to call it the master of disaster blueprint because it's controlling everything. Uh, it's uh, responsible for spawning everything. It uh, holds all parameters for all tracks. Everything is stored in there and being distributed from there. And if I'm selecting a new track from uh, the menu, uh, it will be responsible for you know, spawning all the new systems and killing off the old ones. Uh, so that's what that master controller blueprint here does. And as I said, spawning, first thing it spawns is two of my sonic life from systems that we have been discussing in the previous slide. One for the X with the core elements for the music and one for the Y axis for the add-on and atmo elements. And of course, those systems will spawn their own um, instances of the meta sound sources. And um, yeah, so the controller blueprint gives all the variables and all the info from the, uh, from the track that is playing to the two uh, systems, and they will pass it on to the meta sounds again. And then, of course, we need interactivity. So the master blueprint will spawn a user interface widget by XY widget. And if something is happening there, new user input, that will report back to the master controller blueprint. And from there, 
all the information is being distributed all the way down uh, again through the blueprints to the meta sounds again. And then of course, uh, we also want to have some audio responsive visuals. And uh, for that, I'm using a frequency analyzer. And I'm doing that on the submix. So I'm mixing everything together in the master submix. I'm analyzing that. And the results from the frequency analyzer go to the master blueprint. And um, the, the visuals themselves, they're just a uh, user interface material, simple material. So the controller blueprint will spawn a dynamic material instance with some parameters to tweak. And they will control like coloring and movement and uh, intensity of elements of the visuals. And so the controller blueprint is feeding this information to my dynamic material instance. And this is just simply being used as the background material for my XY widget. And that is my Sonic Lightroom system. It's, I told you, the implementation part is easy. You know? It's just thinking of how, uh, how uh, procedural music systems work and on, on, a, on a basic level. And if you figure that out, and if you know which variables to use, the, the Unreal Engine makes it really easy. So uh, I, 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 want to, I want to play something from my Sonic Lightroom uh, apps uh, to you, but unfortunately, it's, uh, not so easy to connect uh, my iPad to the big screen, so I pre-recorded stuff. So uh, this is a, a video with uh, some parts of Sonic Lifeforms. Um, I've used a few tracks just to showcase how many different musical genres are possible with that. And I even included some tracks twice to show you how differently they can sound when you are coming back to them. So um, yeah, play that for you. So yeah, that's my Sonic Lifeforms project. Thank you for listening. Thank you.